So now since uh, Phil has uh, used uh, the double of the time that he was uh, alluded to that I have to speak double fast and go through this uh, speedy. Uh, so before you get up my presentation, there was a Swedish girl in the audience here that told me that uh, normally you're a little bit too aggressive and a little bit too hard. Uh, so you should try to, uh, to kind of be a little bit of a moderate. So. Your talk stops. Well, so next. Uh, so uh, since you told me that, I thought I'd start my slide with this very little provocative uh, introduction, uh, saying that there is different approaches to how we deal with hammer shock. Uh, it's different ideologies. It's almost like different religions. Uh, I'm not very religious myself. Um, and before I start my talk, uh, we have to. Probably have you read the news lately because you probably didn't have the time to read the news. Uh, so there's some uh, incoming news this morning uh, that uh, I just want to present to you. Uh, this is the breaking news from, uh, from UK uh, coming in this morning. Uh, a new euthanasia strategy uh, to save costs. NHS recommends silent to use an ice bleeding patient. Uh, this is another breaking news from Germany uh, that Germans don't bleed. Uh, and if they bleed, they don't bleed, 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 bleed more than four, five liters. So that's kind of physiological miracle. Uh, so going back to what I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to try to challenge guidelines. You know, everybody likes guidelines. There are different guidelines out there. You have PSTLS, you have HLS, you have uh, whatever. This is European guidelines that was updated latest in 2016. It's, it tries to cover the uh, entire bundle of care from pre-hospital to, to in-hospital. Uh, and... Uh, I'm just going to question some of the some of the statements in these guidelines, uh, and uh, I'm I'm in love with red cells, and I'm going to talk a lot about hemoglobin uh, because I think hemoglobin actually matters, uh, and that the magic molecule that a lot of people are looking for magic molecules. The magic molecules is in the periodic table number eight. You know what magic molecule that is? It's oxygen. That's the magic molecule. So this is just uh, the, the grading of the evidence in European guidelines. 1A, strong recommendation, high quality evidence. 1B, strong recommendation, moderate quality, etc. Uh, and here is some of the things I'm going to challenge. Uh, and I'm going to ask if they are aligned with pathophysiology of shock. So they actually recommend using uh, crystalloid solutions initiated in the hypertensive bleeding patient, grade 1A. I wonder where those evidence paper are. I've been trying to look for those that evidence, uh, I can't find it myself, uh, and they recommend a target hemoglobin of 7 to 9. And when you recommend 7 to 9, they accept 7. They do. Remember, they accept 7. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I'm not going to talk very much about this. I'm just going to throw it out to you, uh, because this is also in the CPR guidelines. Normal ventilate. When you do CPR, there's about one-third of the normal cardiac output going through your lungs. So why normal ventilate when one third of the blood that normally goes to, through your lungs? So uh, you have at least have to define what is normal ventilation in regard to circulation. And they are target systolic blood pressure 80, 90, mean they accept 90, 80. So uh, just to look at different guidelines, these are, these are civilian guidelines uh, and these are military guidelines. So civilians, they bleed crystalloids initially, uh, then they bleed components. Uh, military trauma, they bleed whole blood as that is the preferred blood product, uh, if you are, have whole blood available, that should be your uh, recitation fluid of choice. Uh, and this is ranked from one to five, and only colloids or crystalloids if you don't have any else. Just to say what grading of anemia, this is from the National Cancer Institute. Everybody w knows what anemia is. Uh, severe, 6.9 to 7.9. So to put it in a simple way, this guideline recommends severe anemia in for severe bleeding. Uh, they actually accept up to 50% hemodilution in severe bleeding, because that's what they do. And they promote uh, hypertensive resuscitation prior to surgical control and normal ventilation for all trauma patients. So this is uh, the problem, because we need, we, at least we have to define what is the problem. Uh, the problem is, of course, stop the bleeding, reverse the shock, and maintain hemostasis in the patient. That means that the problem is twofold. Uh, because I think it's important, especially when I try to explain to my blood bankers why we need blood, it's like in the period prior to surgical control, when you have an ongoing uh, uh, uncompressible bleed, you have ongoing central hypovolemia until surgical control. 
So that is, how do you deal with ongoing central hypovolemia to actually have best possible oxygen delivery in that period of time? Because oxygen delivery and lack of oxygen delivery is what, is it what kills you. So when you go from delivery independent oxygen consumption to delivery dependent oxygen consumption, that's when you're trying, to, that's when you're getting acidotic, you're getting uh, uh, actually global uh, cellular hypoxia. That's what's killing you. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about hyper hypertensive recitation with the narrow uh, systolic blood pressure limit. Uh, understanding that having a s such a narrow limit of 80 to 90 is like almost mission impossible in the pre-hospital arena. E even blood pressure cuff is very inaccurate in that range of, of blood pressure. And I don't know if you have done massive recitation in the OR and if you are able to actually hold the systolic between 80 and 90. That is, to me, impossible. And now we require medics to do that uh, with blood pressure cuffs in the field. So uh, an oxymoron, just had to Google what an oxymoron is. So the, uh, one of the things that is, you have to understand the difference between in-hospital uh, recitation when the patient is in general anesthesia versus a pre-hospital spontaneous breathing patient. These are two different physiologies, uh, require two different approaches. Uh, so point of injury, there, timeline, uh, first responder, uh, start recitation, you are in the emergency room, you diagnostics and stabilization, you go into the OR, and you at some point you have hemorrhage control. So in all this period of time, you deal with central hypovolemia. That is your process. How do you deal with that in that period of time? The longer that period of time is, that you should stay in the narrow limit of systolic 80 and 80. Is that sustainable with life? Uh, and I'm just going to challenge that to see if that's possible. So at some point you have hemorrhage control and normal volemia, and then, uh, because if you could have normal volemia in that period of time, you wouldn't have a problem. So uh, yesterday we, uh, Harris uh, referred to the Bickel study. Bickel study is actually one of the most uh, cited uh, uh, studies that started a permissive hypertensive era. But what does this really show? So if you look at the data here, uh, the same hemodynamic, hemodynamic profile from point of injury to the eight minute mark. This is the eight minute mark. F from the eight minute mark, they do the same recitation strategy. And what they find is if you look at the systolic blood pressure here, it's actually the same in both groups, no difference. And you have substantial mortality in this group, 70% in the immediate group and 62 in the delayed. Does this prove that hypertensive recitation is a good thing? Or does it prove that crystalloids are bad? I think it's the last. So uh, this is uh, Kevin Ward's uh, quote. You might have a different opinion, but you can't choose your own physiology. I need some water. This one. Cheers. I'm hemodiluting myself. So fixed equation is the relationship with the what is making up your oxygen delivery. There's hemoglobin, uh, arterial oxygenation, and corticoplet. That's it. Uh, so oxygen consumption, uh, remember that you can only extract 70% of the oxygen delivered. You can only take three out of four oxygen molecules from your hemoglobin. Uh, so if you are a, an average soldier, 85 kilo, will have a resting uh, oxygen consumption of about 300 ml per minute because uh, average uh, resting like when we are sitting here the average resting oxygen consumption is about 140 150 ml per square meter per minute meaning that the critical do2 for this 85 kilo source is 430 per minute below this below this you will have global cellular hypoxia another word for shock and that is not sustainable with life because 70% of 430 is 300. That means critical DO2, 430. So we can start playing with the numbers. So uh, just remember, so the speed of the bleed is important here, but the, we are trying to rescue these patients who bleed fast. Uh, and when you're bleeding fast, you, you, your blood pressure and cardiac output is reduced rapidly accordingly. So if you, uh, Medical Physiology by Guyton, Guyton, you have to read this book. Uh, it's about the relationship, if you draw 40% of your total blood volume in 30 minutes, cardiac output is 50%. So 
according to Guyton, and also some Vic Convertino research group have done some LBNP low bo lower body negative pressure chamber with good compensators show that when they reach the systolic 80 to 90 marks, the cardiac output is 50 percent reduced. So we don't measure cardiac output in these patients because we would like to measure it, but we can't measure it. So we measure what we can measure. We measure blood product, blood pressure, which might not be the best indicator for perfusion. But Emerson, he figured this out in 1945. So this is known physiology. Systolic pressure below 85, 85 is an average blood volume loss of 40 percent, and systolic of 100 is less than 25 percent. So they used uh, their strategy was to resuscitate to at least 100. And that's based on a huge number of patients that they resuscitated in the field. So uh, just to figuring the out critical DO2 lowest survivable hemoglobin with a cardiac output of 3, because it's a systolic 80 to 90 is cardiac output of 3, then your lowest survivable hemoglobin is 10.91. And if your saturation is 90, the cutoff is 11.88, and the guideline recommends 7 to 9. Uh, figuring out critical DO2 and lowest survivable cardiac output with a hemoglobin of 7 is actually 4.67 liters in the patient that I, I just mentioned as this single character. That means that the conclusion that the guideline along for hemoglobin as low as 7 requires close to normal volemia, and that is... Our problem is that we cannot acquire normal volemia. We actually ha oh, this is central hypovolemia all the time. So this is not survivable at all. Uh, so just showing this curve is shown one more time. This is a relationship with the, the oxygen delivery and the oxygen consumption. And you have a critical DO2. This is the inflection point of the curve. And if you are here on the curve, from here to there will be oxygen deficit. And the time spent below uh, the critical DO2 is getting up what is called oxygen depth that has to be repaid. And the higher the oxygen depth, the, 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 the higher the mortality. So you don't like to be there. So your patient, you want to, what you do when you resuscitate, you want to have your patient on the right side of the red line. Uh, and you don't want to be too narrow. So this is your danger zone. Uh, and this is where you want to be when you resuscitate. Uh, a path is going to show a little bit more of this curve. So now seeing this in a little bit different way. This is time here. This is critical DO2 for this single patient, 430. Uh, good compensators, 50% reduction in cardiac output systolic 80 and 90. So remember, those of stroke correlates with degree of coagulopathy and inflammation and mortality. So you don't want to spend much time below the red line. So now, here's the point of injury. DO2 is uh, falling due to bleeding, and the reason it's falling is cardiac output is falling. Hemoglobin doesn't, doesn't fall uh, in the initial when you bleed fast. So here's shock. So when you're in the OR, and you have, like, when your surgeon just flips the, some of the bleeding organs and he starts bleeding, do you start to resuscitate uh, when the patients are in shock, or you do you resuscitate prior to shock? All guidelines tell us you should start resuscitation when you show signs of shock. So you start here. Maybe is that too late, and you try to be above the line. So the uh, time span below the line, the area... Uh, under the curve is the dose of shock, and uh, the green is aerobic metabolism. Uh, and just going to have done some nice animation here. Uh, so you could do this with different products. If you give it whole blood, you are able to stay above that line because the hemoglobin is between 12 to 13, uh, 1 to 1 to 1. Yes, you can, uh, you can maintain that for a period of time, but uh, uh, finally you will be below the line. I'll tell you why. Uh, so this is whole blood, and you see the area under the curve, but that's when you start recitation, when you show signs of shock. So you will acquire some uh, oxygen depth uh, if you don't start earlier. If you start on mechanism of injury only doesn't, and don't wait for the shock to appear, you might be able to stay above the red line all the time. Uh, so this is with uh, uh, one to one to one. Remember, if you give one to one to one in an exchange transfusion, you will if you're lucky, uh, have hemoglobin of 9. Hemoglobin of 9, in my, if you put it into fixed equation, will give you a DO2 of 354, which is below the critical DO2 of 440. So if spontaneous breathing patient, ongoing bleeding with components in an exchange transfusion, will not have uh, enough oxygen delivery if you give components. And if you give saline, uh, the curve is even worse. 
Uh, and if you will uh, start intubate here, uh, I think uh, Pat is going to show you what that's going to be like. Here is a hemoglobin of 7. That's 276, uh, which the difference between critical DO2 and the actual DO2 is massive. So what targets? This is a study from Eastridge, uh, 7,180 used military casualties. They, they measured systolic blood pressure upon arrival in the emergency room. So uh, it started with around 110, and the lower it was, the higher the mortality. So the guideline aim at a mortality of 20%. That's what it says. So do, do we think to aim at the mortality of 20% is a good thing? I would aim at a 0%. Then you have, I think you want to be here on the curve and not here. Uh, so the same is for, for a traumatic brain injury. And by the way, uh, the guideline tells you that if you have ongoing bleeding without TBI, you should not pop the clot and keep systolic between 80 and 90. If you have TBI and ongoing bleeding, then you should just give a shit about popping the clot. But that then the guideline says you should keep s uh, mean, mean arterial pressure of 80. So if we think that we can maintain a mean arterial pressure of 80 with ongoing bleeding and TBI, wh why don't we do that in those without TBI? Well, uh, just remember, outcomes following trauma laparotomy is that if they arrive in the emergency room hypotensive, the mortality is 50%. If they're not hypotensive, the mortality is 12.4%, meaning that hypotension in this group of patients is not good. Uh, this just a reminder uh, that you can read this in Mollison, that is the Bible of blood bankers. Uh, if you give old red cells, and actually it starts on day 21 around, upon transfusion, after 10 minutes, 25% of your red cells is gone from the circulation. They are actually gone. That is not very efficient transfusion, giving old red cells when 25% of your blood is just gone from the circulation within 10 minutes. So that means if you give one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one in a massive transfusion in the hospital where first in, last out is mainly the, what the blood bankers do, that they give you the oldest blood for this patient. Meaning that if you acquire a hemoglobin of 10 with one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one with old red cells, the patient end up with a hemoglobin of 7.5 because 25% of 10 is 2.5 minus 10 is 7.5. So you, the guideline using 1 to 1 to 1, they cannot recommend a hemoglobin uh, above 9 because it's unacquirable. So sub analysis, uh, analysis of proper studies showed, actually the first time that we were able to show, that older red cells have impact on mortality. All the other studies that is done in this area is done in patients in the ICU who is normal volemic, which is another animal. So uh, Phil showed you this. This is just uh, plasma in our circulation here we see is 55%. When you give one to one to one, the plasma volume is 38. Uh, in whole blood is 48. Uh, hemoglobin is 9 to 10. Here is 12 to, 12 to 13. So if you transfuse, this is our uh, trauma pack in Bergen. Uh, if you give six units of home blood and compare to uh, 6 to 6 to 2, total volume transfused 3,000 ml, real blood is 2,622. And here you see uh, you have to uh, transfuse actually 4,150 ml to equal uh, uh, six units of whole blood. So uh, if there are a lot of green people in here, uh, then this is also the advantage of uh, whole blood is organic, natural, non-GMO, free range, gluten free, high in protein, low in carbs. So uh, save the planet, give whole blood. Uh, this is the Emerson from 1945, and uh, I love to read old papers, but there's a lot of experience in those data, showed how people did it in the early stage of time when they recognized that hemodilution was bad. Uh, the considerable proportion of patients in severe shock failed to respond adequately to plasma because the U.S. entered the World War II using only plasma as a resuscitating fluid. And in the North African campaign, they had to borrow a lot of U.K. whole blood. Uh, that pisses Americans off if there's a lot of U.K. blood running in the veins of Americans and they don't like that. So in the last year of the war, they had a whole blood program. They shipped 500,000 units of whole blood uh, 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 to the theater in Europe the last year of the war. So hemodilution in, is inadequate DO2 death by hemodilution. So uh, he 
he just stated uh, that the total average volume of plasma blood required to produce elevation of arterial pressure below 85 to 100 was average 1,250. And they used 100 as their cutoff for a statistic. And that, may, that might be a better cutoff. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that hypotensive resuscitation should be done. It's just where, is the, where do you set your, your limit? Where's your, where's your threshold? Uh, this again, uh, two liters of blood preoperatively, or if not advocate, another thousand, to uh, gain a trigger pressure to approximately 100 millimeter of mercury. Uh, this is also their experience using more than 1,000 cc, a liter of plasma, in treatment of severe shock, resulted in profound anemia, and especially prone to develop irreversible shock. Still, their, own, their experience was that hemodilution is not good at all. Kills patients. Uh, I'm just going to show you this. This is a Korean slide. This is a Korean war. Remember, in the Korean war, they used 400,000 units of cold stored whole blood, group O only. Group O only, with non-registered severe hemolytic transfusion reactions. And it was given to everyone. If you look at, this is evac time, average, two and a half hour. And, and this is severe shock with a case fatality rate of 21%, which is not that bad at all. If you compare your own hospital with this blood use and, and the mortality rate, I'm pretty sure you will not be better than this. But see here, 4.4 liters was given prior to surgery. So why did they, this is not the golden hour, this is like a golden two and a half hour, and they still lived and they survived. And more than 50% of the blood was used pre-hospital and in hospital prior to surgery. Uh, just saying. So uh, this is from 2015. Uh, Bruce L. Robertson, one of the pioneers in uh, battlefield transfusion, transfusion of whole blood suggestion for a more frequent deployment in war surgery. Actually, he's just uh, stating that when you lose blood, you need blood. Uh, and he also stated that adding uh, saline solution doesn't really work very well. Uh, so uh, I'd just say perfuse it or lose it. Uh, and uh, as we have a saying that. Uh, T-shirt saved lives. This is a T-shirt that this is a quote from Pat Thompson, who is going to be the next speaker. Uh, and if we have questions, we're going to have all the questions in the end. Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion if you like to stay here. Uh, and uh, I like quotes a lot. So uh, this is how things change, by the way. And um, since we all like drinking beer, just remember that the Tour Network has its own beer. Low tighter O brew. From actually Norwegian Virgin Low Tide O Brew Bay. So that's uh, th this is a warning for the next speaker, who is Pat Thompson, a very interesting guy. He is a paramedic. He's part of the network. He is uh, he's too smart to me. So uh, I think you're going to enjoy his lecture. Pay attention. Don't sleep. Don't don't fall asleep now because this is going to be good. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank you.